In this week's episode, I am joined by Veronica S. Smith, founder and lead executive of data to insight She and I will chat about REI's new inclusion standards for suppliers, a new artificial intelligence tool to reduce racial bias, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Veronica, let's get started. Would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Bernadette. It's so great to be with you today, focusing on things that are working in DEI. As you said, my name is Veronica Smith, and I'm the founder of Data to Insight. And um, I came out of uh, research science uh, in the 2000s and decided that I wanted to really help people apply knowledge and use it to solve the complex problems of our world. And so um, we created Data to Insight in 2010 because we saw people working on you know, some of our most important environmental education, social and health problems drowning in data and starving for knowledge and wisdom. And so what our mission is, is to partner with people to make meaning of that data and take collective action to create workplaces and communities where everyone can thrive. And so we really envision a world where every person has health, well-being, autonomy, self-determination, and freedom. And so what we are about, our team is about really partnering with people and mission-driven organizations to optimize the impact that they're having in the world by really taking action that has desired impact. Wow. I love you, the vision of your company, by the way. That is that is deep. I mean, there's a lot there. There's a that <laughs> that is that is a lot of work. It's very aspirational and I absolutely love it. I mean, what a better world we would we would have, right? If that when that comes to fruition. So can you talk to me about some of the types of data that you use or collect or analyze that you find are sort of um, big social determinants of success or positive outcomes? Anything that you and the type of data that that you like to look at that you feel is most useful for I mean, I know you do different types of work besides just DEI, but what is what is the type of data that really you find to be sort of the maybe the most efficient Hmm. Oh, wow. That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> the most efficient. Well, I would say, you know, one of the things that is probably the most efficient when we're helping organizations assess their own multicultural organizational identity is to look at data that they already have. So, for example, um, you know, we worked with a uh, publisher that um, had made a commitment, uh, a more deep commitment to DEI in 2021. And they had started working with a consultant that had done interviews with their um, their authors and things like that. And then they had you know, their documents for their organization and everything. And they had a pretty limited resource, uh, amount of resources to kind of go to the next level. And so what we did was we looked at the documents they had, both from that consultant and you know, their existing operations documents, their policies and practices, and then uh, talk with their, their board and their leaders. And we were able to really help them better understand where they were on the continuum from a monocultural organization where differences are seen as deficits to a multicultural organization where differences are seen as assets, kind of identify where they are in that continuum, and as a result, identify some strategies that they could take next. And one of the ones that came out of that was they really hadn't had a deep conversation with their staff. They had a pretty small team, but that was identified as a gap. And so we recommended that they have a team retreat to really, um, you know, 
build those relationships, and then also do a uh, team survey. Um, and so really the most efficient data you want to look at is the data that you have so you can then determine what data you need. And the other key um, about efficiency in looking at data is to make sure that before you look at the data, that you're clear on why you're looking at the data. So what are the key questions that you would like to answer with that data? Because otherwise it can really be easy, you know, even small organizations have a lot of access to data, you know, more than 30 years ago. And so it's really easy to get lost in the weeds of looking through a lot of information, you know, website data, all this kind of stuff. And then you kind of come out and you've identified some patterns and then you're like, wait, what, you know, why did we do that again? What, 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 what do we do with this now? You know? Sure. That makes a lot of sense. I can tell you're really passionate about this, by the way, which is very cool. Very, very cool. Um, Another question for you. Do you recommend and gather data, provide data for DEI reports? Yes. Uh, So, the DEI reports that, or when you say DEI report, do you have a specific type of report in mind? So like an annual report that has oh, a DEI sure. section or a DEI annual report that's sort of a standalone product? Yes, we can do that. Um, and what the types of reports that we provided that have been used you know, for that type of annual reporting or communication are usually results from what we call an organizational assessment that can include like a survey like the Inclusive 360. It also usually includes uh, interviews and focus groups, perhaps some type of benchmarking document review. Um, And then, like I said, we use this framework we call the Multicultural Organization Identity Continuum that can help organizations see where they are on that continuum. And then we can share with them, you know, what are recommended strategies. And so then often what leaders will do is use that to then share as part of their strategic planning communication or, you know, their annual reporting um, on, you know, this is what we did, this is what we learned, and then these are the next steps to advance that, uh, advance this work. That makes a lot of sense. So in this wonderful work that you do, Veronica, what is giving you hope? Well, um, I was really fortunate to get a chance to go to um, a racial equity uh, retreat on Friday hosted by Leadership Tomorrow, which is a leadership development program in the Seattle area that serves the state of Washington. And I actually graduated from that program. It's a nine-month leadership development program the year that I started Data to Insight, 2010. And one of the things that was really powerful about that was that it was the most diverse group I had been in since I came to Seattle in 1991. And it addressed, it had a a whole weekend on racism. And so it really grounded and reawoken my commitment to racial equity and um, intersectional equity um, when I was starting the business. So it's really grounded data to insight in equity. And so now they do these retreats uh, on the, this is the second one. And there were about 30 people there, mostly LT alums, um, wonderful facilitators that had us engaged in activities that involved movement and really challenged me to be very vulnerable, but I felt safe to do so. We had a white caucus uh, group where we got to meditate on some issues that are particularly, you know, about shame for white folks, really filled my cup. And I was just inspired by all the other people that were in the room who are committed to this work, like you and me and my team and our teams. And so just knowing that there are people like that out in the world that I may not see every day. Some I knew, some were new to me. It was just really heartwarming and, you know, again, gave me what I need to be able to continue this work as a justice warrior. And and we need those cup filling opportunities and we need community, right? It's, it's yeah. so, so important. Great. I, I, I sounds like an amazing program. All right. So let's get into this week's good vibes. And I think the first story, I mean, you're in Seattle. This first story is from REI, the REI co-op. I know there are a couple that are like Nordstrom and REI. I'm, I'm glad to see they're, they're doing good. Yeah. So REI has actually established new inclusion standards for its suppliers. So that means that they're going to start requiring their suppliers to have expanded sizes with price equity 
headwear gear large enough to accommodate, quote, higher volume or textured hair, and marketing guidelines that require representation across race, gender, body size, and type, and disability. What do you think? I mean, isn't this pretty amazing that this, what I love about this is that it, it requires the suppliers to do this. So it's sort of the downstream effect, right? They're using their buying power. Yes. And so what I did when I looked at your five things, Bernadette, was I, I asked myself a question, right? So walk in my talk. So why does this action have or not have potential to advance equity in a meaningful way? And so the reason I saw that I thought this does have uh, potential to advance equity in a meaningful way is that it is meaningful because the commitment is measurable. So what you talked about is very specific. So it's not just like, hey, we want you to be more DEI friendly. Like, what does that mean, right? So this is very measurable, They and they set a feasible timeline. Again, so they're being realistic. They're making this something that they're setting the suppliers up for success. Because so often, these types of asks are, don't include those components. And without this, you really do not set yourself up to really be able to have a meaningful impact. And so I was really happy to see that. And also that the commitment that REI has made to be fully inclusive, anti-racist, multicultural organization and create a more inclusive outdoor culture, that's also very measurable. And this is clearly aligned and cascading out of that strategic commitment. So again, if you don't have efforts like this that are cascading from your strategy, then again, this is more likely to be a one-off and not to be something that's going to last over time. And that's what we need. We need efforts that are going to be sustainable because this work takes time. It's not going to, in 18 months, if they do have this you know, increased equipment, that's one component to increase more diversity in participating in the out of doors, which I love that they cited that over 70% of people who are in the out of doors in the last year are white. So this is an important step in that direction. And it's just one piece of the puzzle. So it seems like they recognize that. Yeah, I love it. And I love that this is sort of twofold, not only in more inclusive products, but also in more inclusive marketing. So it's That's right. not just about marketing to get folks in the door, yep. diverse folks in the door, but also products that are more inclusive of those folks. That's right. Okay. So the next story is about a new artificial intelligence tool to reduce racial bias and stereotypes in advertising. So this tool is called X Stereotype. It's created entirely by people of color who used surveys and focus groups to create profiles that represent various demographic groups. Then those profiles go into this AI tool, which analyzes things like scripts and catches stereotypes. So those stereotypes do not show up in advertising. I love this. I mean, it's just gets to the heart, the root cause of bias and stereotypes. Yes. And I really like this too. And I think this has potential to have a meaningful impact because it is filling a gap in existing marketing and advertising and does have the potential to prevent advertising from doing harm by perpetuating hurtful stereotypes. And one of the problems it solved is, so I was involved in AI when I was in college in the early 2000s, working on my electrical engineering degree and became an early data scientist. And so, um, so I understand how um, algorithms get taught and how they learn. And so one of the things that this does is really provide curated learning from a group of people that are underrepresented in the broader internet. Because when you're scraping data, from Reddit and everything in the internet. And again, one of the things that's another issue that we, for another day, but there's a lot of stuff that's getting scraped in these algorithms, uh, broadly speaking, that is intellectual property that they shouldn't be allowed to scrape. A lot of it is very biased. Um, you know, it's a small representation of our population. Usually it's predominantly white and predominantly men. And so having a purposeful sample of people of color who can train the algorithm based on their lived experience of uh, bias is really important. I'd love to see this also be done for gender identity. I think Gina Davis is working on some things like this. And then also on uh, sexual orientation and uh, to avoid heteronormative traps. 
The thing that this doesn't do that's really important to acknowledge that AI can never really do by itself is it doesn't help people learn. So if you're using this algorithm and it's telling you, you know, use this person because they're less, you know, uh, ambiguous person of color, but it, you don't learn why that is, then you're missing an opportunity to help people develop more, greater culturally responsive solutions. And we need people to be able to learn as much, if not more so than machines. No, oh, that is, that is the truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. The third story is about how Hershey's Canada released five special chocolate bars in time for International Women's Day. And one of the featured faces is that of Faye Johnstone, who is a transgender woman. Now, Hershey received a lot of backlash from anti-transgender folks. Um, but I, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, representation is always incredibly important. Absolutely. The thing that I thought really made this opportunity have meaningful impact and in terms of advancing gender equity and, and particularly trans equity is that the response that Hershey gave to the backlash was that this is a, a result of a three-year effort and we appreciate all the people and partnerships that have contributed to making this instead of backing down or coming out with some type of response that showed that they were nervous about the backlash that would have really undermined the whole message. And so I was really glad to see that, again, this isn't just a moment. This is part of a movement at Hershey. And the other thing I love about this is I got introduced to Faye Johnstone, who I did not, I was not aware of. And I'm totally in solidarity with her statement that I will always stand up for women and girls, cis and trans. So I um, am totally just so excited about that. And that's partly what these campaigns are about, is introducing people to heroes and sheroes that we might not otherwise know about. Absolutely. And I think the bottom line always here is transgender women are women. That's right. End of discussion, right? Okay, the set, uh, fourth story is from Nordstrom, which is very committed to increasing racial diversity amongst its supply chain and recently partnered with the Folklore Connect platform to enable Nordstrom's buyers to identify and work with more than a hundred wholesale fashion and lifestyle brands founded by Black, Indigenous, people of color. So again, increasing the diversity in the supply chain. Yes, absolutely. And again, this is something that's not just a moment, you know, it's not like they're just, you know, putting out an ad to say, hey, the folklore group, it's got really great stuff. Nordstrom is really entering into what appears to be a long-term relationship. Amira Rasul, the founder and chief executive of the folklore group, who says she's a, a lifelong Nordstrom customer, as am I, you know, she said that she really sees this uh, as a mutually beneficial relationship. And that's another thing that's so key, right, about capitalism. Our brand of capitalism historically has been exploitative. So looking for uh, mutually beneficial relationships. And this seems like this really can benefit both traditional Nordstrom customers, create new Nordstrom customers, and really benefit Black, Lat Latin, Asian, and other people of color's businesses and designers. Um, so I'm really excited to see what this brings to the Nordstrom marketplace. Absolutely. I, I love this because white Americans hold 84% 84, 84 of total U.S. wealth. So this is the type of initiative that can really make a difference in reducing the racial wealth gap. I, I love this. And again, yes, it's, it is like a more it is a, a sustainable type of thing um, and really can make a huge impact. Okay, so the last story today comes from Gabrielle Union Wade and Dwayne Wade, who are parents of a transgender child. They are celebrities who are recently honored with the President's Award at the recent NAACP Image Awards. And as they were honored, they took the opportunity to praise their child, um, and really just showed what allyship in action means, advocacy. I, I encourage everyone to watch the video, which we'll make sure gets posted in the chat and in the, in the show notes. But really, if you want to see what it looks like to be an ally and to be, even be beyond an ally, to be an advocate as parents or as someone who is, you know, just cares about the LGBTQ community, please watch that inspirational video. Absolutely. This was my favorite of the five things. 
Uh, the Wade family is leveraging their fame to advocate for not only the health and well-being of their child, but also for the health and be well-being of all LGBTQ young people, especially young people of color. And uh, people of color who are LGBTQ are among the most vulnerable in our society. When we uplift them, we are uplifting everybody. And it warmed my heart to watch the video where Dwayne Wade spoke to his child with love and admiration for being true to themselves. And that's such a beautiful role model for parents around the world. That That's what our children need and deserve, to be loved for who they truly are. And I want to give a shout out to the Trevor Project, which is a national nonprofit that I support with my money and my heart. Its mission is to end suicide among LGBTQ young people. And its vision is a world where all of them see a bright future for themselves. There are nearly 2 million LGBTQ plus youth who are considering suicide across the United States on any given day. This is a crisis everywhere. And it touches my life personally. And I know it touches so many people's lives personally. The last thing I want to say on this is this is intersectional equity advocacy. This is something that White culture has remained dominant because it often pits LGBTQ folks against people of color. And what Gabrielle said was showing that there's a need for racial and LGBTQ equity to be seen together, not separate. Absolutely. And uh, folks, if you ha don't get the Five Things newsletter, read the quote or subscribe at fivethingsdei.com, but then read the, read the quote. I mean, it's just, she is just a passionate mama bear calling to action, right? Calling, challenging folks yeah. to really stand up, particularly for, for Black folks and trans folks together, Black trans folks. And she said specifically, Black trans folks are being targeted, terrorized, and hunted in this country every day, everywhere, and there's rarely a whisper about it. So what a challenge for us all. So well said, Veronica. Thank you for thank you for your passion and for mentioning the Trevor Project because that's a, a really important thing. We'll make sure that goes in the show notes as well. Um, to wrap things up, this is Women's History Month. So I wanted to let you know about the National Women's Hall of Fame, which is a really wonderful organization showcasing increasingly diverse women and you can read about some of their honorees at womenofthehall.org, and we'll put those in the show notes as well. So educate yourself a little bit for Women's History Month, particularly some of the amazing BIPOC women who've done things that we haven't even known about. They're, they're names that we we probably don't know in, in uh, commonly, and they, they should be celebrated and honored. So, Veronica, thank you so much for joining me today. How can folks find you if, if they want to connect with you? Yeah, um, I'm on LinkedIn, Veronica Smith, uh, at our website, datatoinsight.com. And um, those are probably the best uh, two places. My email is Veronica Smith at datatoinsight.com. So I'd love to hear people there. And one of the things I just realized, Bernadette, as part of my work as a LGBTQ advocate is to make sure that I say that I am a queer woman. That's one of the reasons why the LGBTQ issues are so important to me. People can't always tell by how I look. So I want to make sure that I'm not inadvertently passing. And to that end, also because of the issue that we talked about, I'm always happy to be a mentor, especially to other queer uh, folks um, in business, because we need, uh, we need all of us to be doing this work. Love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for being an, an amazing guest today. And folks, if you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at fivethingsdei.com. Have a great week. Thanks, Bernadette. You too. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI. DEI.